for joining me today on the life stage we're here to talk all things queerness in the animal kingdom but before we get started can you introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about what you do yeah sure so my name's josh davis i work at the natural history museum i'm the digital uh news editor which means i'm basically an in-house uh journalist for them so i write lots of stories for the web on that side of things I was also involved in the co-creation of the museum's first ever LGBTQ plus natural history tour, um, which we ran in the museum, um, and then eventually turned it into an online tour. And then over the past sort of year, past six months, um, I've actually been writing out in a book for the museum. So that's very exciting. Can you provide me some examples of animal species where same-sex relationships have been observed? And what are the potential reasons behind this behaviour? The, the sort of number that keeps get or often gets banded around at least um is about 1500 different species um so and i mean that ranges from spiders and squids to uh, lizards and monkeys and the fact that there's about i don't know something like two 2.3 million described species to date the idea that it's only then found in 1500 species seems quite ludicrous almost i mean it's almost certainly found in far more um it's just there are very few records of it i guess um, as I say, there's sort of all sorts of, um, um, different examples, right? So you've get, um, in mammals alone, you get it from apes and, um, cetaceans or whales and dolphins, you know, down to, um, marsupials and all that, you know, koalas. There's actually a sort of a really interesting paper that came out not that long ago, a couple of years ago, which sort of was looking at sort of sexual behavior and asexual behavior, um, in the natural world. And sort of rather than asking why some animals were, for example, asexual, they almost like flipped that question on the head and they're saying, well, actually, you know, why are lots of animals sexual? Because there's like lots of costs to being a sexual animal. Um, and there are a lot of advantages to being asexual. So it was super interesting that, I don't know. I mean, I think we're often stuck in this position of like asking why things are that way. Whereas actually, you know, it can be quite freeing to sort of go the opposite direction and say, look, why aren't those things that way, you know? Often, like, mate behaviours can be very aggressive and you could even die before you get the chance to mate. So actually maybe being asexual is sometimes a safer option. Oh, well, exactly. And I mean, like, the other thing about being, you know, a sexually reproducing species is that actually sort of only half the population can actually bear offspring, right? <laughs> Which seems like massive, massive cost from that point of view. Um, the papers sort of seem to conclude that basic, uh, effectively sort of asexual reproduction is more advantageous in the short term but when it comes to the long term sexually reproducing sexual reproduction um is probably more advantageous which is you know yeah it's really interesting but then you have examples which sort of again question that's so there is um uh there's a species of mite which lives in the soil called an um an arbatid mite um and they did genetic tests on some of these lineages and they found that they've been asexual for about 400 million years which like completely blew out of the water, this idea that you can't have an asexual species that sort of persists for a long period of time. We often project like Western gender roles onto animals when we consider like we consider lions to be the hunters, but really it's the lionesses doing all the work. How common is it for animal species to sort of defy those expectations that we put on them? Um, and when it comes to things like hierarchies and dominance and social structures, I think it's quite a common misconception, I think, actually, that the females are always you know the ones at the bottom um and i think over the past i mean the past few decades at least there's been a greater understanding of for example um like mate selection within females so like females have like have a lot more control over like who they're mating with than i think is often um perceived or often um thought about in that sense and i mean one of the sort of most obvious examples i guess would be um like the spotted hyena for example so i mean they um in that species the female um is very much in control um and what i guess you would say is dominant in the clan um and to that extent they've evolved the i mean the extraordinary uh elongated clitoris that looks very much like a penis um <laughs> so it's almost it's basically indistinguishable from a male's penis from just looking at it which i think is absolutely amazing um, and more so than that, I think actually what is more amazing is the fact that the labia have fused to form um, what looked like a scrotum, 
um, and they have like fatty deposits within it, making them almost like testicles within the scrotum, which is just blows my mind entirely. Um, and yeah, so from that sense of view, you know, that is basically a, a, a map. They think that's a, a matter of control. So basically, the female then controls who she can have sex with because it makes it very difficult for a male to um, to force copulation, basically. So as I saw that side of thing, um, but then there are other examples, there's loads of other examples of like where the female is um, what we'd see as, you know, more dominant in the hierarchy. Um, one of my favourites is there's a lovely little bird from South America called the Chicana bird, um, and they live on in wetlands. Um, and rather than it being, you know, an individual male that has like a, has a large territory with lots of females within it, um, it's the reverse of that. So it's a female who has a large territory with lots of males in it. Oh, I love that. I know, it's really cute. And then the males will build their nests and like do all of that duty. And then she'll just go from one male to the other and mate with them and lay her eggs in their nest and then go to the next one. It's really cute. <laughs> That's a lovely example. I love that. Is there any research suggesting that animals would experience what we would know as like gender fluid or non-binary behaviours or sort of animals that don't boil down to one or another in that distinct categories? Yeah, again, like, this is super interesting. There's something which I'm also fascinated by is, like, when we come to, like, language and how we describe these things, right? So, um, for example, you use terms like, you know, gender fluid, and, like, when it comes to animals, um, you know, there's no way to know whether an animal has a concept of gender, right? Let alone, yeah. like, what that would even mean if we are, um, if an animal did have that, you know, there's, there's just no constant way you can you could ever sort of... Um, there's no way you could ever understand what that would mean from an animal's perspective, I guess. Um, and it's a similar thing when it comes to, you know, gay behaviours as well. So, you know, you can never actually ask an animal if it is gay, right? So whenever I'm talking about it, I will always talk about gay behaviours rather than saying an animal is actually gay um, in that sense. Um, but when it comes to things like sex um, and sex fluid, so I would prefer to say like animals are sex fluid rather than gender fluid. I'm like, like there's just loads of examples of um where they don't quite fit what we would consider the binary um so i mean for one of the best known is the whiptail lizards from uh southern us where they have all female species so oh, wow. i mean you can't, yeah so you can't really have a binary when there's only one sex <laughs> <laughs> and they will only ever produce females um so they do it through what is known as parthenogenesis, and there's two different types of parthenogenesis. So you can have either obligate parthenogenesis or facultative parthenogenesis. Um, so one in which um, they do it alongside sexual reproduction, and one in which they only reproduce via parthenogenesis and nothing else. And there's about, to the best of my knowledge, 80 species, I think, which um, only ever reproduce via parthenogenesis, which is genuinely amazing. Um, I think it's 80 vertebrate species. I would probably couch that in so there's a lot of fish a lot of like um reptiles is... reptiles yeah, yeah and a lot of amph that kind of thing um so that's where they only have like a single species and then you know there's quite a few which do have what we would consider you know two set classes but then further than that you've got for example one of my favorite examples is the white-throated sparrow so that's a really common um garden bird in north america actually and over the past sort of decade or so scientists have realized that they've actually been evolving a second set of sex chromosomes. So they've basically been splitting into four sexes within the species, <laughs> which I know, you're like, blows your mind, right? It's just like, how does that even work? <laughs> um, and that's genuinely fascinating. And I love the fact that it's just like this common garden bird. And they realize that... Actually, something's diff different going on, yeah. Exactly. And um, there's been caught sort of mid-evolution almost. Um, so that side of things, and then obviously you go to the real extremes, if you're like talking about like fungi, for example, so scientists, um, mycologists, they don't really talk about sexes in fungi necessarily. They'll talk about um, what they term mating types, but they are effectively analogous to sexes. So it's um, regions of the DNA which um, uh, need to be swapped over basically, so they need like compatible um, mating types um, in order to reproduce. And some fungi, so there's a split gill mushroom, um, has what, is, what scientists reckon are 23,000 mating types. So I guess that's kind of analogous, 23,000 sexes, which is amazing. Um, and again, it's just like incomprehensible. Um, but they think that's probably just so that the fungi, like no matter what 
individual a fungi comes across, they can reproduce regardless, right? You know, you're, you're very unlikely to come across a non-compatible individual, um, which I always think is really funny. Um, but even then, like, so, like, we're sort of limiting ourselves, I mean, fungi aside, to animals. Like, if you think, if you go into, like, the botanical world, um, and you're talking about, sort of, sexes and um, how sexes are organised, like, the botanical world, like, all bets are off, right? This is one of my favourite things about writing writing the book I've been writing, is that, um, yeah, like, botany is just wild. Some animals are capable of undergoing, like, physiological changes, um, that result in either reversible or irreversible like sex change. Can you tell me some examples of those? The ones that always stick out to me are Finding Nemo. Like if Finding Nemo was actually set in the real animal kingdom, I think people say that when his mother dies, his father would have turned into his mother and then it would uh, change the whole plot of the movie. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. One of my favourites. Um, yeah, so when it comes to, I mean, I sort of mentioned before, you know, if you're talking about like sex fluid animals and the change of changing changeability of sex, like um, that in biology, that is what is termed um, hermaphrodites. So um, hermaphroditism, hermaphroditism. Um, the term is obviously slightly different when we're talking about humans and you don't use it anymore. Um, it's deemed, um, yeah, it's fallen out of use, let's put it that way. Um, but for animals and for biology, it's still very much in use. And it basically just refers to any individual that can produce both the male and female sex cell at some point in their life um and so yeah so when we get to clownfish and finding nemo um clownfish are what are known as a uh sequential hermaphrodite so that is where they change from obviously one sex to another um and in uh clownfish they do it from uh male to female so yes they live in typically um uh little groups in anemones um and you'll have a dominant female and a sort of high-ranking male, and those two will mate. Um, and it'll only be those two are mate, and then beneath the high-ranking male, there'll be a number of sort of subordinate males, basically. Um, and when the female dies, if the female dies, you know, that that dominant male will take her place and change sex. So, um, as in fighting Nemo, uh, <laughs> to become his mom. Um, but more than that, and this is where it gets slightly dodgy, um, the next sort of, the next male in the hierarchy will take the place of the previous one. And so if finding Nemo is being entirely correct, then Nemo should have become his new mum's partner. So yes, that's what is known as a simul, um, a sequential hermaphrodite. You then also get what are known as um, simultaneous hermaphrodites. So those are individuals in which um, they produce both at the same time. Um, and they are, you know, one of my favorite examples of that is there's a, a fish called the mangrove killifish. Um, and it is the only vertebrate um, that can uh, internally self-fertilize, which is really amazing. So it produces both the eggs and the sperm within its own body and then mixes them together in its body cavity and then lays fertile eggs. That's the only known vertebrate that can do that. There's various populations around the um, Gulf of Mexico, basically. And then they live in like the mangrove forests and some populations are basically all hermaphrodites but then curiously like there's a population i think on belize where about a quarter are male which is really weird <laughs> yeah exactly um so it's really it seems really location dependent so um, within animals they reckon about i think about five percent of all animal species um studied so far at least um are hermaphrodites um but again like going back to the plants if you go back to plants um, within flowering plants alone, it's something like 85% of what we would consider hermaphrodites. I mean, in plants, you call it slightly something, well, you call it something slightly different. You call it cosexual flowers. What role does evolutionary biology like play in understanding these like different sex groups or like queerness in the animal kingdom? Actually, for evolution or for these traits to persist within these populations, these traits just have to not be disadvantageous, right? So they just basically have to not harm a population in order for them to persist through time, which I think is a sort of, it's a very subtle difference, but I think it's one that quite a lot of misconceptions come from that. Um, and then even, I mean, if you're sort of looking at these babies, I mean, a lot of the literature or the understanding that I've read about it, the, in many cases, they will talk about like the social benefits of heterosexual behaviors as well. So for example, um, you know, most species aren't actually um, 
almost individuals, sorry, aren't 100% queer. They'll be showing homosexual behaviors maybe early in their life when they're younger. And when they get older, they then start to um, reproduce and have sex with the opposite sex. Um, so there's that side of things. And they think that maybe that those behaviors are providing some sort of social um, sort of bonding behavior between maybe young males um, or between young females. Um, and that's certainly true in some species. So for example, like bonobos, um, what um, are often termed sexy apes, um, <laughs> they will they'll have, I mean, like they're probably up there as one of the species that displays the most amount of sort of homosexual behavior um, in like every single range and combination possible. Um, and they will often have, like the females will often have sex um, as like a greeting, for example, and like and like if they are um, uh, fighting or if there's some sort of conflict, they will often have sex to resolve that conflict. Um, so there's obviously like that social benefit to it and that side of things. Um, so I think that's like a potential. I mean, as I said earlier, like I just don't think there's necessarily one particular example that covers everything. Um, there's probably lots of different reasons and um, outcomes for it. Um, and even then, if we're talking about like the persistence of behaviors and genes, I mean, another really good example is that of um, black swans. So black swans live um, in Australia. Um, and about, I think something like 30% of all couples are homosexual parents. It's like a huge number. Um, and the, the, the male, the male, male pairings, they will either um, one of them will either have sex with a female and they'll chase her off and they'll then raise those eggs themselves. Um, or um, the other one, which I think is maybe slightly funnier, um, is that they'll, they'll find a heterosexual pairing and the males will just chase the heterosexual pair off their nest and then just steal it. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, but what's really interesting about that is that the male-male pairs are often more successful at rearing young than the male-female pairs. Oh, yeah, it's really cool. So they think that there's a couple of reasons why they think this is. They think part of it is to do with the fact that the males, the male male parents are able to maintain larger territories than the male females. Um, but then the other one is that um, in some of the studies, they found that one of like the limiting factors for the success of chicks is um, the female's like incubation ability. Um, and because the male male um, pairings are more equitable when it comes to sharing incubation duties, they think that that results in a in a higher rate of um, chick success or chick survival. Quite often in the literature, queer behavior is described as being like paradoxical or like, you know, um, oh, what other, yeah, all sorts of terrible words used to describe it. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, there are some really good examples <laughs> where it's not, it's actually advantageous. Are there more instances of animals adopting or nurturing young from either like unrelated individuals of the same species or... Because often, um, like, sisters will care for their other offspring, won't they? Is there more of that going on? It happens quite a lot in gorillas. I know this for a fact. So, I mean, I studied gorillas for a little bit um, after university. And they're, like, they definitely, within um, the troops of gorillas, they if a mother dies, then the rest of the group will adopt that um, youngster. And quite often, um, again, this all goes back to that, what we were talking about earlier about the sort of persistent ideas that you know males are brutish and don't care about their offspring and all that sort of stuff within those troops it's quite often the silverback the dominant male who will adopt that orphan and look after it um which again sort of goes against those notions of like how fathers or how we think male animals and fathers act and then also within apes again like in bonobos there have definitely been examples of um not just within groups but um, individuals adopting uh, orphaned bonobos from other um, communities. So they're like definitely, you know, there's no way to know whether they're genetically related to anyone within the group, but they'll still um, adopt them and look after them. Um, and then I did actually read just before some other amazing examples of um, sort of cross species as well. So there's oh. an example of, yes, there's an example, there's a really cool one. There's an example of, um, I think it was a bottlenose dolphin um adopting an orphaned melon head whale i think it was in french polynesia and the female had the female dolphin already had um a baby already had her own offspring and she adopted this other whale and took it along for the ride i guess <laughs> 
can you describe any ongoing or recent research that you've come across that sheds light on some interesting piece of diversity and gender behaviours in the animal kingdom or some really fun examples of queerness? I think one of the best examples recently is um, there's an evolutionary researcher called um, uh, Jess McLaughlin, um, and they wrote an amazing paper on um, sex, um, the sex binary, and whether sex is a spectrum from a biological perspective. Um, and their their work is, yeah, it's like it's just, like if you want to learn about this, then definitely look that paper up. Um, it's super interesting, and it's basically looking at about how when we're talking about sex, we're often talking about like a number of different characteristics, right? So we're talking about not just, for example, you know, the size of the gametes that we're producing, but we're also looking at our external characteristics, our internal characteristics, um, our genetics. Um, and so when we're using terms such as sex, like you have to be really clear about what it is that you're actually referring to within that and how a lot of those characteristics themselves are then on a spectrum. Um, uh, you know, and so I've, I, it's a super interesting look at that debate and that topic from a biological and evolutionary perspective and how better to navigate it, I guess. And it's all just about being clear with what you're talking about when you're referring to these things, I guess, a lot of the time. But yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How do sort of human cultural perceptions of queerness, like in a human world, uh, influence how we study queer behaviours and homosexual behaviours? in animals do you think there are a lot of biases that people have that need to be addressed in this field yeah so i mean the one thing that you learn very quickly when you're doing this sort of research is that there are a lot of biases in the scientific literature <laughs> um, i know we quite like to think of science being very objective and very scholarly and studious but um it's yes yeah, it's, it's just full of it i mean as i was touched on earlier like the language that is being used is often just like really heavily loaded um so there are plenty of examples of papers which describe um, queer behaviours as being like abhorrent, um, and you know, um, uh, I say disgusting, no, paradoxical is what which I always remember because I just find that really funny. Um, uh, but yeah, like the language being used is just like so morally loaded and so um, uh, heavily biased. I, it's, it, I find it sometimes extraordinary when you're reading these papers and you think this is a scientific paper that was published in a scientific literature. You know, there's the, one of the really famous examples is there was a paper published, I think it was only in the 80s, and it was about um, butterflies, and it talks about the moral degeneracy of, of butterflies <laughs> because they're displaying queer behaviours. And when it comes to sort of the general history of queer, um, queer natural history in the study, um, yeah, I mean, there the, very little bit was basically written down, but I mean, there are a few examples throughout the centuries where it is being talked about. Um, but it is sort of mainly in the 1800s where it sort of comes to a fore. Um, and even then, you know, the language is very, is very careful. And part of that is to do with, oh, clearly to do with the fact that, you know, homosexuality was illegal um, and people were concerned about drawing parallels between what they were seeing in the natural world and what was happening in humans. Some of the terms used in modern day, I almost have a bit of an issue with sometimes. It's all sort of very medicalized, I find, but... Yeah. It's like what you're saying about, like, anthropomorph, you know, are we anthropomorphizing things too much, or, you know, but yeah. there are different... For example, quite a lot of the time, homosexual behavior is referred to as same-sex sexual behavior. Um, which is a real mouthful to say, <laughs> <laughs> first of all, which is one of the reasons I don't like using it, because it's quite a tongue twister. Um, but I also find that really funny, because like same-sex sexual is basically homosexual, right? But they're using these terms. Um, and I would love to, I, would, I haven't properly talked to anyone about this, but I'd love to talk to some scientists about that, about like, why is that better than using the term homosexual, for example? Is it? Is it because you're trying to couch these behaviours slightly differently to human behaviour. I don't know. Yeah. What would you like to see happen in that field to make it more or less biased, I suppose, is the better way of phrasing it? I think one of the main things is just people reporting these behaviours, right? So, I mean, like, as I said, like, at the very beginning, only sort of 1,500 species um, have, you know, sort of a, a, a documented 
um, queer behavior. I mean, that number comes from a book called Biological Exuberance by a guy called Bruce um, Bashamill. Um, and that is like the most amazing book and like the the reference book for um, queer gay behaviors. Um, but for him doing that research and him to come up with that number, like he did his literature searches and looked through it and he found he found some, but not very much. And it basically took him going around and phoning people and emailing people and asking them, have they observed this in their study species? Because there's so little literature out there about it. And I was talking to one researcher about this, and they were basically saying that part of the issue is that nowadays, you know, it's it's very difficult to publish something like natural history notes, you know, like interesting findings that are not necessarily part of a wider study. So there's not really, there's a, there's a sort of distinct lack of places where people can just publish like interesting natural history notes about what they're seeing. And so what I would think would be beneficial would be a, a better place for people basically to report these things and to talk about these things. Do you think it's not been reported because people like potentially further back in the past as well didn't want to report those behaviours for sort of fear of, you know, the community or what would happen, the reaction? There was certainly a lot of that in the past. So like one of the... Um, best examples of that is the, the um, Adelie penguins in Antarctica. Um, so on Scott's um, expedition in 19, I want to say 1911, um, the one in which Scott fatefully died, he also had on board with him um, a surgeon slash naturalist called George Murray Levick. And he was the first person to ever um, experience like the full breeding cycle of Adelie penguins. So he was observing all this behavior and he observed loads of like sort of what was sort of deemed, I don't know what the word is, you know, sort of unacceptable behaviors, I guess, for the time. Um, and these included um, things like necrophilia and what they were considering like forced copulations so or rape, but also homosexual behaviors. And when he came home, when he got back to England, he tried to publish all of this data, all this information in a book. Um, and when he went to when he submitted that book, the keeper of zoology at the time at the Natural History Museum, at the Natural History Museum, basically excised that entire chapter on the sexual behaviors of the early penguin and said, like, this is not this is not appropriate for publication. Um, and then they printed that up on a on a separate paper, on like a leaflet, and they made a hundred copies of it. And at the top it says like not for public um publication. And they and and they published the book without it and they published these separate leaflets and gave them to people who they presumably deemed um, important enough to, under, to know this. And nobody knew about this for 100 years until <laughs> in 2012, they found one of these leaflets in a book in the Natural History Museum Library. There's a really interesting thing that actually um, Bruce um, Pajamil says in his book that when he talked to scientists and particularly young scientists when they're observing these things, they didn't want to report them because they thought that they themselves might be stigmatized, which is like, like really tragic, but also yeah. like, yeah, but like a really interesting, like, look at like this, like almost like the human sociology of like what people are thinking and like within their sort of scientific communities. Um, and that was also something that um, uh, Anne Innes Stagg, who is the lady who um, first documented queer behavior, homosexual behaviors in drafts, she said that when she was reporting it, she came up against loads of um, loads of pushback for saying that. So they, her report found that in some populations of giraffes, um, up to like ninety six percent of all sex is gay sex, which is <laughs> again like <laughs> massively high figure. Um, which when she came to publish that, she got a lot of pushback, and she um, said in an interview at one point very explicitly that she felt like she had a duty to talk about these things. Um, because she had um, like quite a few like lesbian uh, postdocs and students, and so she felt like she she needed to talk about these things in order to help push push it through for for, for her younger students, which I thought was like really amazing. Yeah, incredible as well. But then I suppose we have to be careful because I was going to ask you: Can the study of queerness in animals help us avoid anthropomorphism? And like help us maintain like an objective perspective on we're watching animal behavior this is not the human psychology sort of thing yeah i think definitely i mean when i talk about it i'm very 
clear to at least mention or point out, you know, like when I'm talking about this, you know, this isn't a justification for any sort of behavior, like because queer behavior needs no justification. Um, you know, it is, you know, it cares, it's it's normal, it's natural, it's fine, it's, you know. Um but I think there's something that I have noticed recently and I find it super, super interesting in that sort of previously in the sort of I don't know, Middle Ages, eighteen hundreds, I guess moving into sort of up to the 1960s, 1970s, you know, the, one of the prominent arguments against homosexual behavior was that it's not natural and it's not found in the natural world. Um, and that was how they were sort of justifying the stigmatization and the um, persecution of queer people. Um, and then, you know, you get to the, I guess, late 70s, 80s and 90s when these more and more reports of queer animals were coming out. And that argument obviously was completely neutralized and it's like well actually no it is found everywhere in nature and what i'm finding interesting particularly recently is that that is almost being turned again on its head and that when people are sort of saying i think particularly when it comes to um uh the sort of trans rights and that kind of um uh uh sort of stigmatization i guess um when people use examples of nature, they're now being told, um, uh, uh, you know, it's it's homophobic, it's transphobic to be comparing people to animals. And so I find, and I've seen that cropping up more and more, and I find that really interesting that it's almost now being flipped against the queer community. It's almost like the queer community neutralized that argument and now that's being weaponized against them. I think people like to think science is objective. Um, but actually, everything that everyone does is subjective, and everything everyone does is um, coloured by their experiences and their beliefs and their thoughts. I always think about, for example, like Jane Goodall when she first started studying chimpanzees. When she first started, when she first went there, it was obviously only men who were doing it. Men were doing the research, um, and all the chimpanzees were given like numbers, right? And she went in there and very specifically started naming them because she was like actually you know these are individuals with personalities and these are you know these are not just numbers on a form and she was really heavily criticized for anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing those chimpanzees um even though you know we now know that obviously they do have personalities and they do <laughs> and they are individual animals and they are individual beings um and so i do find that very i always find that very interesting that that notion of anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing and like when is too much and when is too far i don't i don't know the answer i don't know where that line is i want to just ask you a little sneaky question about your book if i may do you have a working title or something that you could share with us and when could we possibly be hoping to have a copy in our hands oh hopefully fingers crossed um it will be published at the beginning of next year so first first half of next year is probably as far as I can go. <laughs> That's fine. I don't want to get you in trouble with your publishers. Okay, lots of working dates, lots of moving parts at the moment. Um, and I guess, I don't know, I will be really sneaky. I'll probably get told off this, but the working title is A Little Gay Natural History. Oh, incredible. Well, that seems like the perfect place to end it. Thank you so much for joining me on the live stage. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk all things queerness in the animal kingdom with you. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. It's been really fun.